Hello, my name is Tom Hope, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm pleased to be given the opportunity to talk about the appropriate use of PSMA PET in clinical practice. These are my disclosures. Now, when talking about appropriate use, I have to introduce the idea of the Protecting Access to Medicare Act, PAMA, which was passed in 2014. The PAMA Act established a program to increase the appropriate use of diagnostic imaging services, particularly high-cost studies such as CT, PET, MRI, and other nuclear medicine studies. This act instituted the requirement to use a qualified clinical decision support mechanism, otherwise known as CDSM. These clinical decision support mechanisms help determine whether or not an ordered study is appropriate in an individual patient. Ordering providers whose ordering patterns are outliers will be subject to prior authorizations, and claims that do not include CDSM information will not be paid by Medicare. The current deadline for using appropriate use criteria in CDSM software is January of 2023. In order to develop this for PSMA PET, the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging developed an appropriate use criteria which was published in January of 2022. This document was developed in collaboration between medical oncologists, urologists, radiation oncologists, and nuclear medicine physicians. The way that clinical indications are graded are that they are scored on a 1 to 9 scale. Scores of 7 to 9 are assumed to be appropriate for that specific scenario. Scores of 4 to 6 and 1 to 3 are considered rarely appropriate or may be appropriate. It should be noted that in the setting of the PAMA guidelines, a score of six or lower is considered inappropriate and will not be covered by Medicare. The committee developed 11 clinical indications that were graded using this system, and the first type of indication were the initial staging indications. Five initial indica staging indications were developed. The first two, those who have suspicion of prostate cancer that are being evaluated for targeted biopsy, or patients with very low, low, and favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer who already have a histologic diagnosis of prostate cancer, were graded as rarely appropriate. Scenarios three and four, those patients with newly diagnosed unfavorable intermediate high risk or very high risk prostate cancer, either without prior conventional imaging or with conventional imaging that determined negative, equivocal, or oligometastatic disease were considered appropriate. Scenario 5 is referring to patients who have conventional imaging demonstrating widespread metastatic disease, and that was considered may be appropriate in the setting of PSMA PET. These gradings were based upon two clinical trials at initial staging. The first performed in collaboration with UCLA and UCSF of gallium-68 PSMA-11, and the second, the DCF-PYL Osprey trial. These were very similar studies. The first had 277 patients who underwent prostatectomy at initial staging. The second with DCF-PYL with 268 patients who underwent prostatectomy at initial staging and correlated the findings seen on PSMA PET to those seen at pelvic lymph node dissection and prostatectomy. There was a very similar sensitivity and specificity between the two studies. It should be noted that the PSMA-11 study did allow a small uh, intermediate risk prostate cancer where 22% of the patients were intermediate, whereas the DCF-PYL were all high-risk patients with slightly different inclusion criteria. Additionally, it should be noted that the pro-PSMA study was a prospective randomized study of 302 men who received either PSMA PET or conventional imaging. In this study, the sensitivity for metastatic disease on PSMA PET was 85% compared to 38% for conventional imaging. This sensitivity is slightly different than a detection rate that you might be thinking of in the setting of a biochemical recurrent setting. It was a sensitivity compared to a composite endpoint, including histopathology, presence and number of metastases, other imaging modalities, symptoms, and change in lesion size. It should be noted the pro-PSMA study only had 4.7% of their patients who had pelvic nodes confirmed by histology as a primary endpoint. I think of these two, this study being a complementary study to both the Osprey study and the UCLA-UCSF imaging study.
In the pro-PSMA study, they also looked at a change in management and found that a 31% of patients had a change in management when using PSMA PET compared to 23% for conventional imaging. As an aside, prostate patients at initial staging, the uptake in the primary tumor does correlate with the sensitivity for nodal metastases. So in a subsequent analysis of our primary staging data uh, that was published in 2021, when you look if the uptake in the primary tumor is less than blood pool, the sensitivity is only 0.25, and it increases to 0.47 if the uptake is greater than the parotids. So just be aware that there can be patients such as this, where you have low-level uptake in the primary tumor, and therefore also low-level uptake in nodal metastases. The second set of indications that were graded were biochemical recurrence indications. In this setting, in scenario 6 and 7, with a PSA persistent arise after radical prostatectomy or a PSA rise above a nadir after definitive radiation therapy, these were scored as appropriate. PSA rise after focal therapy of the primary tumor, for example, HIFU or cryoablation, was graded as may be appropriate. And the issue in this setting is it's unclear what a PSA criteria is for biochemical recurrence. The biochemical recurrence indications were based upon the UCSF, UCLA, and Condor studies. In the UCSF, UCLA study, 635 patients of biochemical recurrence were included. 223 of these met the composite endpoint. In the DCF, PYL study, 208 patients were imaged at biochemical recurrence, and 132 of those patients met the standard of truth. The average PSA was higher on the PSMA 11 data, and they had very similar positive predictive values or correct localization rates, slightly different terminology which was used in the two manuscripts. And you can see the patient level detection rates were very similar and when PSA stratified. So for example, when the PSA was less than 5 in the PSMA 11 manuscript, there was a patient level detection rate of 38% versus 36% with DCF-PYL. In essence, identical results. The last groupings of indications that were graded were castrate-resistant prostate cancer patients. Scenario 9 was the only graded indication as appropriate in non-metastatic or M0 CRPC patients on conventional imaging. Scenario 10, a PS tr post-treatment PSA rise in the metastatic castration resistance setting and evaluation to response to therapy were both graded as may be appropriate. The data that supported the non-metastatic CRPC indication was a retrospective review of 200 patients who had a PSA greater than 2 but negative conventional imaging on CT and bone scan. The average PSA in this population was 5.3, and PSMA PET localized disease in 98% of patients, which is quite high, indicating that a non-metastatic CRPC does not exist. The important finding of this study was that 39% of patients had unifocal or oligometastatic disease that could potentially be treated with metastasis-directed therapy, which is why there was thought to be a clinical benefit of PSMA PET. Now, what about selecting patients for PSMA radial ligand therapy? It's clear that PSMA PET is predictive of the deposited dose. So in this patient, you can see that there's much higher uptake in the tumor compared to the liver and parotid glands with an SUV max of 31. This then correlates with the subsequent deposited dose of the lutetium labeled PSMA 617. And PSMA PET clearly should be used to select patients for PSMA radial ligand therapy. In the therapy study, it should be noted that an SUV max of greater than 20 was required for inclusion criteria, whereas the vision trial required uptake greater than the liver. The PSMA appropriate use criteria will be updated after the approval of Lutetium 177 PSMA 617. We should also note the NCCN guidelines, which also include PSMA PET. It includes it both in initial staging, matching the indications in the SNMMI appropriate use criteria, also in the setting of biochemical recurrence, again similar to the SNMI criteria. It also includes progression on castration-sensitive prostate cancer systemic therapy and in patients who subsequently develop castration-resistant disease. It also includes M0 CRPC patients similar to the SNMI criteria. One other point is that conventional imaging before PSMA PET should not be required and I do like the wording from the NCCN panel, which states that the panel does not feel that conventional imaging is a necessary prerequisite to PSMA PET.
Similar phrasing is used in the SMI AUC document stating that PSMA PET is more informative than conventional imaging and so may be considered the new conventional imaging. In summary, the CMS PAMA uh, Act will require the consultation of a clinical decision support mechanism by 2023. PSMA PET is appropriate in unfavorable intermediate high and very high risk patients at initial staging and at time of biochemical recurrence after radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy. Guidelines will be updated after the approval of lutetium PSMA 617 for the selection of patients for radioligand therapy. I'd like to thank the PSMA Appropriate Use Criteria Writing Group who helped develop the document and thank you very much and I look forward to answering questions.